Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, Jai Trivedi, on behalf of chairman and members of Justice P.D. Desai Memorial Lecture Committee and trustees of Praline Public Charitable Trust, welcomes you all for the 18th Justice P.D. Desai Memorial Lecture on the topic of importance of constitution in the modern democracy, new challenges. Before we proceed with today's function, as per our tradition, we shall begin our function with a prayer by Sri Amar Bhatt to recite to us a few verses of Vaj Govindam by Sri Adi Shankaracharya. शब्द से यो ध्वनि ध्वनि रंतर गतम ज्योति ही ज्योति रंतर गतम मन है तन मनो विलसम यादि यद विष्णु हो परमम पदम भज गोविंदम भज गोविंदम गोविंदम भज मूढ मते भज गोविंदम भज गोविंदम गोविंदम भज मूढ मते संप्राप्ते सन्निहिते काले नहीं नहीं रक्षति डुक्रुन यकरने भज गोविंदम भज गोविंदम माँ कुरुधन जन यवन गर्वम हरति निमेशात काल सर्वम माया मै मिदम अखिलम हित्वा ब्रह्म पदम त्वम प्रविश विदित्वा भज गोविंदम भज गोविंदम कस्तवम गोहम कुत आयत कामे जननी इति परिभावय सर्वमसारम् विश्वम् त्यत्वा स्वप्न विचारम् भजगो विन्दम् भजगो विन्दम् सत्संगत्वे निसंगत्वम् निसंगत्वे निर्मोहत्वं निर्मोहत्वे निश्चलतत्वं निश्चलतत्वे जीवनमुक्ति ही भजगो विंदम् भजगो विंदम् भो विंदम् भजमूर्मते गैयम गीता सहस्रम धैयम श्रीपति रूप जस्रम नैयम सज्जन संगे चित्तम देयम दीन जनाय च वित्तम भज गोविंदम भज गोविंदम गोविंदम भज मूढ मते गोविंदम भज मूढ मते गोविंदम भज मूढ मते ओम 
थैंक यू उमर भाई मे आई रिक्वेस्ट श्री सुरेश शलत सीनियर एडवोकेट एंड चेयरमैन ऑफ जस्टिस पी डी देसाई मेमोरियल लेक्चर कमेटी टू गिव द वेलकम एड्रेस good afternoon to our distinguished guests at london and uk participants good evening to all our friends here it's a matter of great pride and privilege to me to join honorable trustees of pralin charitable trust and members of the lecture committee in extending a very warm welcome to you all we are particularly gratified and happy that sri gopal subramanyam has found time and agreed to speak to us today the subject as chosen by him is importance of constitutions in the modern democracies and new challenges we today have also before us honorable the chief justice arvind kumar justice mukesh bhai justice bela ban justice subhash reddy honorable judges of our gujarat high court justice ck thakkar ms shah we members of legal faculty mayuri madam from gls university dr rawal from gujarat university students faculty members and leaders of newspapers the pralin public charitable trust founded by a great and eminent judge shri prabodh bhai desai who lived his life as an example for all of us he worked hard and lived economically all throughout his life and left his heritage for the future upliftment of weaker section and for the legal fraternity his sterling qualities endeared him to all of us and endearment was coupled with great regard and reverence the trust has been working incessantly to further and promote the objects for which it is set up over and above organizing thought provoking lectures and seminars the trust has contributed generally over the years in the field of education providing medical aids upliftment of women and people in tribal areas the trust has also provided funds to the working for mental and physically challenged people hospitals at jagadia and slu college for women i know that today's guest requires no introduction but his achievements requires special mention to be made before these warriors subramanyam started practice by joining the chambers of sri soli subarji in year 1980 he was designated as senior advocate suo moto by the apex court in 1993 he was appointed as additional solicitor general of india from 2005 to 2009 he had on the office of solicitor general of india for the period from 2009 to 2011 his contribution to the field of law is not restricted to courtrooms as a counsel but also to various international forums even as an expert witness on indian law in various international arbitrations and proceedings his ability to assist the field of law is not only to litigation but also as a transferer of legal education he is credited for introduction of a all india bar exam when he was the chairman of bar council of india his current assignment speaks a lot about it he started the subramanyam study center at prince of wales eddington center where in the efforts are made to advance the understanding of mental health disorders by bringing together experts from variety of fields and providing a foundation for interdisciplinary collaboration but the last thing i would add is what i came to know when i had a word with mr subramanyam is that subramanyam is currently involved in a scientific research concerning molecules sometimes i ask myself still how much sri subramanyam would contribute to this profession and this world now it is time for me to request the honorable guest to share his thoughts on the subject we are all eager to listen to him thank you sir it's an honor and privilege to invite shri gopal subramanyam senior advocate supreme court of india 
to deliver the memorial lecture on importance of constitution in modern democracies and new challenges. Respected Mr. Shalet, the glorious galaxy of judges and lawyers, my learned friend, the Advocate General of Gujarat. There are so many of you on the screen whom I can recognize. I acknowledge each one of you with a deep sense of humility and remembrance. Mr. Shalit said very kind things, but all that I can say very humbly is, all this is due to the blessing of the Guru. That is why we have a verse in the Guru Gita, which is actually a verse of Vedanta. Agnana Timiran Dasya, Nyanan Jana Shalakaya, Chakshurun Militam Yena, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. The word Guru itself has got two letters, Gu and Ru. Gu is supposed to be a signification of darkness, Ru is supposed to be that omniscient spirit which dispels darkness. And every day, of the human life is only this exploration of being able to expel darkness and be of use to others who are around us. Uh, life does require that constant uh, self-negation. And what better state or high court than Gujarat where one has seen such towering personalities whether it be in the context of freedom, whether it be in the context of the law, whether it be in the context of law and literature, whether it be in the context of statesmanship, whether in the context of judicial independence, whether in the context of legal excellence. I'm deeply humbled to be present before all of you. I have seen Justice P.D. Desai only once in my life when he was a Chief Justice in Bombay. And he had a very powerful presence about him. I've had some of the distinguished colleagues here on the screen who have recounted about his fearless independence. And all said and done, ultimately, it is the independent judiciary and the independent legal profession informed by canons of righteousness and justice, which deliver ultimately the aspirations of justice, which are so fundamental to human existence. Justice is as great a need as food or water. And the aspirations of justice require to be addressed all the time. And that is why we have the instrument about which I wish to speak today, that is the Constitution. Justice Desai, of course, had the distinction of serving three different high courts as Chief Justices, Marshal Pradesh, Calcutta, and Bombay. And members of the bar have always recognized him as a skion of the independent judiciary. I have so many memories. Some of them are parental. My late father, who happened to be a lawyer, who was admitted to the Supreme Court by Chief Justice Mahajan, actually was also a junior of the late K.M. Munshi. And he had the great good fortune of being able to edit his book called Pilgrimage to Freedom. Uh, that is indeed one of my first connections. And of course, I've had the opportunity of seeing so many wonderful members of the legal galaxy here in my career as a lawyer. And I feel deeply privileged to be present before 
each one of you. In fact, I will begin with the words of Chief Justice P.D. Desai in the context of illegal mining. But the few words which he spoke then are really perhaps words of wisdom and the perennial nature of wisdom is that it acquires different dimensions and different shades of light in illuminating dark corners sometimes of our mind, existence and search. He said, there is both a constitutional pointer to the state and a constitutional duty of the citizens, not only to protect, but also to improve the environment and to preserve and safeguard the forests, the flora and fauna, the rivers and lakes and all other water resources of the country. The neglect of failure to abide by the pointer or to perform the duty is nothing short of a betrayal of the fundamental law which the state and indeed every citizen, every Indian, high or low, is bound to uphold and maintain. In 1748, Montesquieu published his monumental work on the history of government. He opened up a new era of reflection and deliberation on the conditions under which nations are governed. He concluded very far-sightedly that there is no ideal political constitution. In the spirit of the laws, he advanced a theory of relativity. Constitutions express the history and culture of a people, varying in form according to particular social, economic, and geographical conditions. The new documentary constitutions adopted across Europe after Napoleon had imposed the French way of thinking about government, for example, were hardly struck from a single template. They were drafted according to political circumstances, which continued to exhibit considerable variation. In the latter half of the 20th century, increasing numbers of states were described as constitutional democracies. And from 1990s, the growth in these numbers has been substantial. By the new millennium, almost every state seeking to legitimate its rule in the eyes of its citizens and the world felt obliged to adopt a written constitution incorporating a separation of powers, a commitment to the rule of law, the protection of individual rights, and the holding of free and fair elections. At the end of the 20th century, it appeared that there was only one banner in the town, and that game was constitutional democracy. One answer to this is an answer that post-World War II constitution makers have increasingly given, is that their constitution should reflect and incorporate the fundamental values of their society, often in the form of constitutional rights. India's constitution is nothing less than the instrument which imagines and institutes our democracy. It is this dual function of the constitution which gives it a perennial importance in our democracy. There is also a growing trend to understand these constitutional rights as designed to secure a fundamental meta principle frequently framed as human dignity. With the evolution of constitutional discourse and the need for democracy being able to advance human aspiration, human dignity as a core value has significant place. The need for fulfilling human aspiration is correlated to the duty of government 
to secure natural rights, such as those instantiated in late 18th and early 19th century European and American constitutions. The governments are instituted to secure certain inalienable rights, an assertion which David Armitage in 2008 suggests may have been more influential in global political history than any feature of the text of the American Constitution. I urge that to make further sense of the role that dignity plays by examining the important roles of courts, which will oversee the emergence of dignity, coinciding with two other common phenomena in rights interpretation, the use of the comparative method and the slow collapse of the distinction between international human rights and constitutional rights. A scholar, Charles Bates, who takes a position different from Raz and Rawls, he sets out in detail the most important features of the human rights practice. And he says that I cannot distinguish the domestic practice of rights creation and interpretation from the global practice of human rights. A scholar by the name of Sally Mary once observed that instead of viewing human rights as a form of global law that imposes rules, it is better to be imagined as a cultural practice, as a means of producing new cultural understandings and actions. Necessarily, principles of understanding, tolerance, reconciliation are vital to such an effort. The power of authority needs to be matched by awareness of the daunting purpose that one individual for the sake of justice as important as the rest of the world. It is necessary to emphasize that society does not become a political arbiter in dispensation of justice, but it assists in the creation of a live, robust, judicial fraternity entrusted with the avocation of a judging by the wealth of character of independent men learned in the law and whose hearts understand the yearning for justice. The constitution is rarely at tryst with this aspiration as old as any ancient text or scripture. There are any number of ancient texts, and particularly the Upanishads, which touch upon different imminent natures of ultimate reality. It is, of course, in the context of non-dualist reality. But in society and in human life, the Constitution contemplates dualism. That dualism is central to constitutional discourse. Over time, we can see the development in some jurisdictions of a view that international human rights provisions illustrate a set of shared values and that it is the part of the function of the national judiciary to embolden these provisions to take part in effect a common interpretative enterprise with judges in other jurisdictions. As one author has put it, some courts have construed human rights as part of an international public policy, the expression of a higher law. What are the challenges which we face today? Is it the inability to acknowledge that power itself is limitations? But authority has 
a capacity in the human mind. The very nature of authority, as modern evolutionary psychologists have indicated, has the capacity of overwhelming the mind. The human mind is prone to fear. The human mind is prone to easy acceptance. The human mind, because of the evolutionary need to stay and live, readily accepts what is a path of least resistance. And that is why the limitation of self-restraint is somewhat personal in character. But the greater restraint which a constitution imposes is through an institutional mechanism where tradition and individual talent both merge in collective memory. And that is the institution of the courts of justice. The institution of the courts of justice are nourished by denial, by self-sacrifice, by lofty idealism, and by convergence, coupled with the perspectives of tolerance, humanity, and deep, unconditional empathy, whether it be for the advocate or whether it be for the person for whom the advocate is making out a case or a cause. Indeed, in the journey of such institutions, moments of strife in development could arise. But I urge that our optimism, our positivism must always inspire the future because our dynamism is ultimately one of innovative creativity. And this dynamism of innovative creativity is, although lodged in the frontal cortex of the brain, but is largely manifested because of the aspiration of relatedness to other human beings. That is why the word fraternity, which is used in the preamble of our constitution, is a word which has multiple connotations of relatedness. And this concept of relatedness itself is a stepping stone to the foundational principles of fairness, due process, and that justice must always manifest as an ongoing tribute to our faith and the constitution. The two words faith and the constitution sometimes need to be spoken a little disjunctively because faith is a personal journey. It is one which is profound, which is intrinsically private and the constitution is slightly agnostic to the personal faith except it guarantees as a part of the journey, the freedom of conscience and in that the freedom of belief and the capacity to choose belief as one would like. Therefore, the primacy and the freedom of the, con of the conscience is in some sense indicative of the faculty which resides in us because Conscience, as indeed both Western and Indian thinkers have pointed out, is that innate faculty which provokes, which inspires mutual respect, inclusive understanding, and indeed gives space for cognitively translating human rights or fundamental rights. Fundamental rights require not only acknowledgement, acknowledgement is only the primary stage, but in the journey of fundamental rights, the second stage is one of cognition. The third stage 
is one of translation. The fourth is the stage of effectuation. Fifth is the stage of declaration. Sixth is the stage of reconciliation. It is a dynamic process. To lead life according to the constitution involves not only external work, but it involves a realignment of our own inner belief systems with those which actually serve more fundamentally neutral areas and canons of social order. To be able to uphold a position of empathy requires a foundational humanism. And that is the celebrated character of the law, of the constitution, of the legal profession, and the avocation of adjudication. The constitution, therefore, is a constant companion for all of us. Sometimes we may fail to discern answers when we look for answers in the moment, but we must trust that a document of such wisdom will carry in it the innate and incipient moments of future wisdom. I draw particular inspiration from the recollections of someone who faced bitterness in his own life and who lived with that bitterness. I'm speaking about a person who is one of the great modern architects of constitution and real action. I'm speaking of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, whose experience in truth and reconciliation and his rendition of what he went through in that commission but what made him deeply humbled was that every victim of injustice was seeking closure, was seeking reconciliation. And he said he wanted to see whether there was a lesson in any form of human strife, in any form of human tragedy in any form of human loss. This has particular reference to all of us, just as we are emerging from the pandemic. All of us have been touched by the sheer spectacle of loss. And the loss has been enormous, both in terms of numbers and in terms of our personal sovereignty, our personal relationships. In that state, how do we use moments of tragedy to new reconciliation? And that is where the constitution, if it is a dynamic one, if it truly is like the living tree as our constitution is, if it is, as ancient in terms of the willingness to enable wisdom to come from any side, any direction, at any point of time, then we must believe that in the very nature of loss is the beginning of a new journey of some other gain. It is the ability to perceive that moment as intrinsically dynamic, special, rewarding, that we manifest our fundamental human uh, potential. That is why temporality is useful in terms of reference of time, but temporality is never an answer to denial of justice or injustice. Therefore, we must bear in mind that the demands of a living constitution are always of increased self-accountability. Before anyone else 
it is self accountability and that is truly the nature of a living constitution where we are actually privileged participants faith is an active affirmation and the constitution partakes something of faith which is it is also an instrument of affirmation and therefore some jurists have argued that human rights derive their genesis from the concept of equal concern and respect some others speak about distributive justice and of course as i mentioned in the forefront it is almost on the fringe of exploration of human dignity human dignity is today the global articulate while philosophical schools may propound as i said a degree of non dualism in spiritual life but constitutions which are set in social and contextual settings always imply a degree of dualism and this dualistic system or this dualistic setting in fact is meant to proclaim and celebrate the innate freedoms of man in other words there can never be something called self celebration any celebration can only be in the context of a society a state and the various facets of our institutions which enable such a celebration i must mention at this juncture that a departure from the effective role of a constitution as a guiding star can often produce cognitive dissonance and cognitive dissonance has a strange characteristic which is one of denying a contradiction it is the ability in us to face contradictions within our own selves in the world around us and to find resolutions in peaceable manner in the medium of discourse in the medium of concourse in the medium of dissemination of ideas and information that we are constantly growing thus i would like to say that when justice chandrachud in his judgment in putta swami consciously said that the individual is the focal point of the description of rights this stands to reason why because again like 65 other constitutions which allude to we the people in some form our constitution has constituted not only people as the ultimate repositories of sovereignty but that the people out of their entrustment have actually given to themselves a republican constitution founded on equality and respect that is why our constitution makes the state truly republican it is a res publica which is a common area shared by all citizens not to the exclusion of any one not to the exclusion of a segment not to the exclusion of any part of our society thus the constitution is intended and that is the challenge how can human flourishing happen in the face of a pandemic how can human flourishing happen in the face of illnesses how can human flourishing happen in the face of adversities but these require innovative solutions they require not only infrastructural spaces of innovation in our own mind but translating them into socially engaging patterns of human conduct that is why when i speak about the august high court like gujarat 
its protagonists have stood for values. Its members of the judiciary will always remain living legends of inspiration. Any number of instances can come to mind. We have had great Gandhian judges, advocates. I can see some of them even on the screen. I feel humbled by their presence. All that which one can say is that art and literature in conjunction with law is indeed a facet of a philosophical and exponential growth of the human dimension. It is the capacity to explore human dimension, whether through sciences or the arts or through discovery or through even computational neurosciences, actually takes our minds to the farthest ends of the galaxy. The universe is not such a small place. The universe is substantial, but even though we might simply be pressure points of inflection, but we have a cognitive self, we have a real self. The real self is that which is promoted by the constitution. Hence, when Albie Sachs said that a constitution sometimes can be the autobiography of a nation, it seems perfectly a legitimate comment. Of course, there are sine qua non arrangements in all constitutions, like free and fair elections, like respect for the verdict of the people, and of course, separation of powers and the charter of rights being enforced and respected by courts. Our constitution is futuristic in character. One of the reasons I say that is that one of the articles of our constitution, which has still not been employed, which is Article 32, sub-Article 3, in fact contemplates what is called a trilinear judiciary, where all the strands of our judiciary are of equal competence, equal prowess, equal independence. That is indeed futuristic, but we should hope that one day it is achieved. That is why our constitution requires in terms of its implementation, frequent empirical reassessment, self-audit, and shall we say, the audit of social expectations. It is a very difficult exercise to undertake given our interest in preserving self-confidence, but ultimately, it is in seeding such self-confidence to larger scope of aspirational audit. Sometimes there can be lessons of a very different kind which can be achieved. I would therefore say that the living tree is indeed the correct metaphor. And constitutions which function as living trees bring about an enduring quality to the existence of those societies. And therefore, we must always bear in mind that the web of choices which our constitution has offered are fundamentally based on principle. They are based upon the individual's freedom cohabiting with social good. And therefore, constitutions are not only instruments of political sovereignty, they are morally instruments of self-government. And self-government of both individuals and societies is achieved by the concept of limited powers. And there is a certain element of truth to the very nature of power being limited either by duration of time or by, shall we say, circumstances. It is existentially a real facet. And therefore, the limitation on powers is a fundamental kernel in our constitution.
the characteristic feature in the effort to limit powers is not only term limits for an elected government, but the government to consciously engage with the aspirations of people, subject, of course, to the guarantees of rights. The separation of powers is vital because ultimately it is only a limb of the state which is completely independent, independent of belief systems of either the legislature or the executive, which can perform its function. There is something called beliefs. There can be personal beliefs, but the theory of neutrality, which underpins judicial avocation, indeed requires a truly humbling constitutional transformation. The best example of that transformation is when judges, despite their extreme learning, still feel unsure, still feel uncertain, still see such strong merit in two different opposing points of view that they wrestle for what they think should be the correct answer. It is this ratiocination, which is not only a part of Samvada, is not only a part of conversation, this ratiocination is ultimately the deliverance insofar as the aspiration for justice is concerned. I would like to conclude my remarks and my reflections, and I share them with you in a spirit of utmost humility, is a scholar, and I found that this excerpt has stayed with me. He's a person called Michael Ignatieff, who in 1999 recounted and saw human rights as a part of the argument about what we can and cannot, should and should not do to other human beings. While he said that there may be a need to signal an end to rights inflation, but he said still there was a ground of minimalism which is based upon the ground we share. This, he says, in the past, was based on the intuitions that derive from our own experiences and our capacity, which he terms a natural fact about human beings. And this capacity is to empathize with others. And he says, we possess the faculty of imagining the pain and degradation done to other human beings as if it were our own. I thank Mr. Shellett, who is one of the great leaders of the bar in Gujarat, who is a shining example of the best that our profession has to offer for having given me this opportunity to be able to share with you some of my thoughts on the subject. The subject has many dimensions. It is not feasible to explore all dimensions very easily because there are chasms of interconnectedness which belong to other disciplines. It could be social anthropology. It could be cognitive psychology. It could also be other rarefied forms of sociological studies, including very closely to aspects of cognition in mental health. I take this opportunity of thanking all of you to make available your time this precious evening to be able to have an opportunity to hear some of my thoughts. I am in India. I am not in the UK. But wherever I am, 
I will be beholden to all of you and particularly to the great savants of the state who give it its lustrous ever abiding character. And I only want that the tradition may always continue. Thank you, Mr. Shalit. Thank you, sir, for sharing your thoughts and enlightening us. Now may I request Sri Kamal Trivedi, Advocate General for the State of Gujarat and also the members of the lecture committee to propose the vote of thanks. Our today's esteemed speaker, Sri Gopal Subramaniam, Honorable Mr. Justice Mukesh Bhai Shah, Judge Supreme Court of India, Honorable the Chief Justice of High Court of Gujarat, respected Sri Arvind Kumar, present as well as former Honorable Judges of the High Court of Gujarat, Honorable Mr. Justice C.K. Thakkar, former Judge, Supreme Court of India, Honorable Mr. Justice Mohit Bhai Shah, former Chief Justice of Bombay High Court, Honorable Mr. Justice Kalpesh Bhai Javeri, former Chief Justice of Orissa High Court, respected trustees of Pralin Public Charitable Trust, members of Pravod Bhai Parivar, my colleagues in Justice P.D. Desai Memorial Lecture Committee, and the distinguished gathering of lawyers, senior advocates, student friends, and invited guests. Very good evening to all. It is indeed heartening to see that even during these challenging times of pandemic, we are in a position to have this 18 Justice PDSI Memorial Lecture virtually, whereby we have got together under the auspicious of Praveen Public Charitable Trust, founded by late Justice P.D. Desai, whose memory always serves as a beacon light for all of us. The 32nd President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, had said, I quote, let us never forget that government is ourselves and not an alien power over us, I unquote. In my opinion, a democracy essentially weighs supreme power in the people who exercise state power by electing representatives under a free electoral system, thus forming a government of the people. Such government formed by the people is for the people and is reflective of the voice of the people. On this note, let me make this opportunity on behalf of Pralin Public Charitable Trust and Justice Pini Desai Memorial Lecture Committee to sincerely thank our today's distinguished learned speaker, Sri Gopal Subramaniam, for having, for sparing valuable time out of his busy schedule and gracing today's event. Sir, thank you very much for sharing from the wealth of your knowledge. Your address on today's topic on this memorial lecture was thought provoking and has enlightened our minds. In his stimulating address, Sri Gop Gopal Subramaniam has distinctly described that effective and efficient modern democracies have about five defining features. He said commitment to rule of law, fair and free elections, separation of powers, and protection of human rights. Sri Subramaniam very vividly described about the characteristics of a live constitution. According to him, constitution is like a living tree. As rightly put, the constitution is a constant companion of the legal fraternity as it guides us in our journey. He also said that as members of the fraternity, we also carry a responsibility to ensure that its spirit is preserved. Sri Subramaniam describes six stages in the journey of fundamental rights, like acknowledgement, cognition, translation, effectuation, declaration, and reconciliation. Mr. Subramaniam has quoted Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who has said that every victim of injustice is seeking closure or reconciliation. 
Our esteemed speaker has provided enough thoughts on today's topic to be pondered over hereafter. Once again, our sincere gratitude to Sri Gopal Subramaniam for having readily accepted our invitation to inspire all of us by his very erudite address. Before summing up, I would like to part with an interesting piece of information about our distinguished learned speaker with the addresses of today's event. An eminent lawyer, jurist, former Solicitor General of India, and a recipient of National Law Day Award for Outstanding Jurist. Sri Subramaniam never wanted to become a lawyer, but he wanted to be a poet or a cricket commentator. But for the promise given by him to his mother, he certainly would have been a poet in the league of T.S. Eliot or a famous cricket commentator of the likes of Brian Johnston. But I must say, however, loss of field of art is a gain of the legal world. As I conclude, I would like to make a special mention about Sri Suresh Bhai Shrelath, our chairman, and Justice Kalpesh Bhai Javeri for being strong pillars in arranging this memorial lecture. I would also like to thank the volunteers who have worked behind the scene for making today's virtual program a great success. Special thanks to our trustee Sri Amar Bhai Bhatt for beautiful rendition of a prayer and Sri Jai Bhai Trivedi for comparing today's program. Our sincere thanks to the August audience for joining and being part of this event. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much.